So today we're continuing on a series that we've been on for uh, several weeks now, and uh, it is entitled The Watchman. It's really God really tuning us up in the area of our prayer and our relationship and our connection with Him. How many know it's important to be connected with God? It is important that we are connected with God, and that's really what this series has been about. And I want to encourage you to take out the... uh, In the worship guide, there's a set of notes there. We encourage you to look at them with me as we walk through this message this morning. As you can see, the subtitle of this message is entitled, The School of the Holy Spirit. The School of the Holy Spirit. And I'd like us to look together at the opening verse there as a foundation for our uh, message today. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 14. If someone can just uh, disconnect the uh, fan over there, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The grace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says the love of God or the love of the Father. And he says the, the, uh, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The traditional says the communion of the Holy Spirit. And that word fellowship or communion means partnership. It means togetherness. It also refers to friendship, companionship. It gives the idea of doing life together. In fact, really the best word there that, that you could translate that would be partnership. And so we can clearly see that it is Paul's prayer from this letter, and Paul wrote this letter to the people at Corinth. It is Paul's prayer that our lives be an ongoing, continual, close partnership and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because when we were born again, something beyond anything that we could imagine was placed on the inside of us. In fact, that's why one place he said, if any man is in Christ, he's a brand new creature. And what the Lord did for us through Jesus Christ, through his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, what he did for us through the cross was so great that we need partnership to help us live this out. And that's the role, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to help us understand what really took place when we asked Jesus to come into our lives. And when we stepped across the line of faith and asked him into our hearts, something beyond anything that man could have imagined took place. And we need a school to learn how to live this life out. And today I just want to talk with you for a few minutes about the school of the Holy Spirit for just a moment. And, uh, you know, when you are born again, you and I become, the Bible says, sons of God. that, That refers to men and women. You're a son or a daughter. But the word, the scripture just used the word sons of God. And so when we're born again, something amazing happened. We became sons of God. And and this is more than just a religious title. In fact, it's not religious at all. It is a real description of who we are. We are literally born of God. We literally have God's DNA. And and, and the reason I want to deal with this for a moment, because I believe many times there's a disconnection between what we really are and, and what we really live. Because if you just stop and think about it with me for a minute, think about some of the titles that God places on us once we are born again. This is not all of the titles, but listen to some of the names that they call you and I who are born again, who are in God's family. Again, this isn't all of us, but just listen to some of these. That when we are born again, the titles that they place upon us is amazing. They call us sons of God overcomers, kings, children of God, triumphant, a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a disciplined mind. They call you light of the world. They call you a believer. They call you justified. They call you healed. They call you glorified. They call you set apart and sanctified. They call you healed. They call you blessed. They call you heirs of God. They call you light. They call you ambassador. They call you a joint heir with Jesus. They call you possessor of all things. 
And if that one messes you up a little bit, that's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 21 through 23. They said, all things are yours. This is the labels that they place upon you. They call you ambassador. They call you the one spirit with the Lord. And they call you seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Now think of this. All of these labels that they place on us. And just think of those lofty high labels. But I don't know about you, but if we could just be honest for a minute, don't you believe that there's a real disconnect between those labels and what we've lived out as a whole in our personal lives and in the church as a whole? Is that right? And there's no condemnation in that, but I believe at some point in, the, at some point in our lives, we need to pause and say, wait a minute, somewhere there's a breakdown. Because I'm telling you, everything that that scriptures said about us is what we are called to actually experience and walk out. They are never just calling us things just to call us something for the sake of religion. God literally means for us to walk these things out. Think of those titles. Ambassador and representative of Jesus. That, you know what a representative is? That's someone who's a, who stands in the place of another person. So, so that says Jesus calls us representatives. That means that we have the capacity to show the world who he is. Amen. Wow. I wonder if there's more to being born again than we thought. That's why I love that song. What does it mean to be saved? Is it more than just the prayer we pray? More than just the way to heaven? Oh, it's way more than that. And it's the role of the Holy Spirit to make all of those labels that we just read a reality in our lives so that there's no longer a disconnect. There's no longer a breakdown between what they've called us and what we're living out. Amen. Amen. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit because what he put in us is so great that it takes someone to help bring this out of us so we can begin to live this out. And that's called the school of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to school us, wants to school me and school you and teach and train us how to also go from where we are and running around circles and cycles of defeat and lack and, and sickness and brokenness and anger and fear and frustration and move our lives on in Jesus and move us forward and advance us in life. That's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. But you see, we have to go to his school. We have to learn these things so that we can live this out. And so there, uh, you can see in your first write-in, you could say it this way, that really the Holy Spirit wants to be your life coach. Wants to be your life coach. You know, that's a popular word now anymore in our culture, life coach. This person's a life coach, that person's a life coach, that person's a life coach. And basically what it comes down to, a life coach is just someone who comes along to tutor, to mentor, to strengthen, to sharpen. They can see things, they can know where you want to go, what you want to do, and they come alongside of you to help you achieve your goals or to fulfill the potential that's on the inside of you. Well, Holy Spirit is the ultimate life coach. Because he's God Almighty. He's, he's not just a coach with a title. He's actually God. He knows the past, the present, and the future better than you know your name. And he knows how to take you from where you are to where he's designed for you and I to be. He wants to be your life coach. In fact, uh, he's, he's the best teacher there is in the world. How many know if you're going to, anybody that's achieved something great, most people have someone that's coaching and helping them. You know, never, no one ever really achieves anything great on their own. There's really no such thing as a self-made man or woman. <laughs> there isn't. Someone alongside of them has helped them. They've learned. They've read. They've been trained, sharpened by someone, and that's God's will for us. But we've got the greatest teacher and trainer and coach in the world. He is Holy Spirit, and we've been neglecting him. He, he, he's been without work. He's been unemployed in many cases in our lives, and he wants to help us go from where we are in our life, in our family, in our marriage, in our parenting, in our finances, in, our, in every area of our life. He wants to train us, but we've got to engage with the Holy Spirit. We've got to develop a partnership. That's what that word says. May the partnership, may the friendship, may the sharing of life with the Holy Spirit be yours forever. God has called us to share life with the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 14, verse 26, in the New Living Translation, and they'll help you there on the screen as well if you don't have it in a Bible or electronic Bible there, it says, but when the Father sends the advocate or the comforter as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, 
He will teach you some things. Huh? He will teach you what? Everything. What does everything mean? It means all things. All things. He will teach you all things and on top of that, he will remind you of everything that I've taught you. So he will teach you all. There is nothing in life that we can learn, that we need to learn that the Holy Spirit cannot teach us. And he didn't say all churchy things. Come on, somebody. Come on, he said all things. That means relational things. That means parenting things. That means financial things. That means opening a business things. Come on. That means being a leader things. That means being a husband things. Come on. That means being a wife things. Come on. That means being a good friend to somebody things. He can teach us friendship. He can teach us relationship. Come on. There's not any area of life where the Holy Spirit can't teach us. Always make your confession. Father, I thank you that I can learn all things because I have Holy Spirit dwelling within me. Amen. See, we need to start taking these words that we see in the scripture and making them our confession. Amen. Too often we confess what we see. Too often we confess what we feel. Too often we confess out of our emotions, out of our soul, out of our feelings and, and what's sensual, what we can feel and taste and see and smell and emote with. But God has called us to begin to raise the level of our conversation, to begin to confess what he says. Even when we can't feel it. Come on, that's a good place to shout amen. Even when it doesn't look like it. It's, a, it's, it's saying what he said. It's saying the same thing. God is looking for someone who will agree with him. The first thing, if you're going to partner with somebody, you at least got to agree with them. You at least have to be on the same page with them. Come on, you at least have to sing from the same sheet of music. And if the Holy Spirit is saying you can do all things and you say, I can't do this, then you're not singing on the same sheet of music. And you can't fellowship. So the fellowship, the first rule of fellowshipping and partnershiping and doing life with the coach, the trainer, Holy Spirit, is to agree with him. Right? How can two walk together unless they're in agreement? But when he comes, he says, he will teach you everything, remind you of everything that I've told you. Now think about this in our culture. Think about this. This is amazing. In our culture, in our society, as a child, you have to go to school for at least 12 years from the age of five. At least 12 years. Watch this. Before our culture and society even says you're really fit for the most basic level of being able to function and contribute as an adult in society. Don't we? What is it called? It's called a high school graduation or GED or the equivalent thereof. But they're saying there's a certain level of education, there's a certain level of hours, there's a certain level of, of tutelage and instruction that you have to sit under and get under your belt before you're really capable of functioning in this society before you can really work and contribute and have enough knowledge to even be able to, first of all, survive and take care of your own self. Let, not to mention anybody else. And then, of course, after high school or the equivalent graduation diploma, what have you, after that, then, of course, there are certain specialized skills you might take. There's certain specialized knowledge you might take to become an entrepreneur, to become a business owner. You might have certain abilities that you can go in business and begin to develop things and systems on your own. Or there's also, of course, the traditional college and university approach to things. But there's always higher levels. But our society says you at least have to finish 12 years. Now think about that. We accept that and don't think anything of it. And yet the greatest coach and teacher and trainer in the universe we ignore most of the time. Yet we respect a system that says you must go to school 12 years. Then we respect the system so much says you have to do a certain level of college. Have to do, and I'm not knocking college, got a degree, I believe in it. You know if it's a part of your purpose, get it, get two degrees, get six of them if that's what the Lord said. Are you listening to me? But what I'm saying is how many times have we heard the stories or looked in the mirror and looked at our story? and looked at all the school we took and still aren't doing anything with what we took. Yet still paying the bill. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on. Co co listen, listen. And, and listen, that knowledge in and of itself doesn't guarantee you a successful life. Right. But look how, much, look how much weight we put on it. 
Look how much prestige we give to it. Look how much pride we as parents have and when our kids go to certain schools with certain names. Look how much glory we, we, we ascribe to ourselves. When at the end of the day, it won't make them anything in and of themselves. We know in the system it has certain influences. It can put you in certain orbits and circles and connections. I get all of that. But at the end of the day, it does not make a man or woman. It's what you are on the inside. But what I'm saying to you, particularly as a Christian people, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we've got the greatest teacher in the world on the inside of us. And God is calling us to engage with him a whole lot more than we have engaged with him. Because he can take us further than any university degree can take us. He can take us further than any connection that we have. And I believe in good godly connections that God is, I believe in all of that. I believe he's behind it and sets that stuff up if we're walking with him and pleasing him. But what I'm saying is the ultimate gift, the ultimate teacher is the Holy Spirit himself. And, it, and it's time to engage with him at a whole nother level. Praise God. Now listen, here's the idea. Here's the thing that's so interesting is how many know whoever you hang around, you, you, be you tend to become like that? You know, and whether it's simple, little, light, funny things, or it could be something even more serious, positive or negative. I remember this is just a little, little, little silly thing, not even a big deal, but like, um, like how many like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Come on, somebody. That's, come on, that's American classic. Come on, who doesn't like? Come on, let's pray for them right here. Get my team up here. We'll lay hands on you and pray for them. If you don't like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, what is wrong with you? Well, I've, I've liked them, you know, as a kid. And I, I remember um, when we got married uh, 20 years ago now. And uh, we, um, I think one day I just came home and, and I just had a taste for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, uh, you know, if, now if you're professional at it, uh, what, you, what you do is you, you, if you know what you're doing, you will lightly toast the bread. Come on, somebody, you lightly toast it. So then when you get that, that peanut butter on there, it, it, just not, it just moves real smooth, and there's a little bit of runniness to it there, just, just, just a little bit of the peanut butter melted, right? Maybe cut it in half if that's your thing, or you just... Yeah. So one day, I, I was making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and, and Pastor Steph, she said, wow, that, that looks good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as wives do, when, you, when, you, when we as husbands have something on our plate that looks good, come on, fellas, what happens? They, they want to, you got to have some. You got to have some. And she told, I couldn't understand this for years after, I said, why, why does she always want what's on my plate? <laughs> What? Now, now, part of it, you know, from, from, a, from a God thing, you know, like I said, you don't even know you're selfish sometimes until you get into a situation that can bring that out. And I've always said that marriage is God's workshop. Yeah, amen's got a little more somber right there because <laughs> folks start, folks start, mm, yeah, people start thinking about things. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have little ways in us that, that God is wanting to work out, and I believe he does use the, the gift of marriage to work that stuff out. I believe that's one of his ways. And, uh, but then the other thing, I just learned this, that she told me this, that when, as a husband, when I have something that looks good on my plate, it just looks better on my plate. <laughs> like, even if she didn't want it, when I, if it looks good on my plate, that she said, that's what wives do, they just like it. And anyway, she wasn't a big peanut butter and jelly person. And then all of a sudden, when she started enjoying them, she started liking peanut butter and jellies to the place that sometimes she would just make them on her own. Now, that's a light little thing, no consequence in life. But the point that I'm making is that that rubbed off on her. And the only reason it happened, because she's been with me. So what I'm saying is, whoever you hang around, what's on them will rub off on you. It'll rub off on you. In fact, in fact, next writing says this. It says, it says this. You will eventually become like the one you spend quality time with. You will eventually become like the one you spend quality time with. So, so the more we spend time with and engaging with, fellowshipping with Holy Spirit, we will become more like him. Hey, watch this. Look at me for everyone. Look at me. He's not going to become like you. <laughs> I, bet you I bet you that. 
Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. He's not becoming like me or us. Because somebody's going to change. And it's going to be us. And in fact, I think about the scripture that the elder apostle John said in his epistle. I think it's 1 John chapter 3, around verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. Somewhere in there, he says this. He says, we know this, that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right? Which means if, if there's going to be a change, he's not changing. We're going to be more like him. Now, right now, we already are like him. And, we're, and the more we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, what we really are begins to shine more clearly how much we are like him. The Holy Spirit wants us to fellowship with him. That's part of why God gave us Holy Spirit, to, be, to, to fellowship and so he can rub off on us. I tell you, when we fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he begins to change us on the inside. He begins to change our outlook and change our perspective and change, watch this, the chemistry even of our emotions. Your emotional state is not set. You are not just always bent to be, uh, to be depressed or upset or bothered or triggered by this or that. You are not always, you are not bent to be set where you are emotionally the rest of your life. That is not the case. You are victorious. Holy Spirit will come, and as you fellowship with him, if there's any weak places in our emotions, in our psychology, in our perspective, Holy Spirit will come and he'll rub off on you because he's got no weaknesses, friend. He's got no defects. He's got no kinks in his armor, friends. He's got no defects. He, he, he's, like a, he's like a, excuse my sports analogy, I always got to go here. What do you say? Sue me. You know, I'm a guy. It's like a guy who's got a perfect game. Right. We say certain players, you know, in, 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 in shop talking around the hallways, we say stuff like this or you hear commentators say things like this. He's got no weaknesses in his game. He can do it all. Right. He, he's got no weaknesses. No matter where you put him on the court, he, he can do it. He can score from anywhere. He can defend as a top, uh, top five first team defender. He can score from anywhere, behind the arc, low post, outside, inside, outside, off the dribble, off the, you know, off the, off the pass. No matter how, he can score. You can't stop him. That's how God wants to make you. Where there's no weaknesses in your game. No weaknesses in your game. Come on, because if we just wanted to think about it, come on. Any one of us are 20 seconds from getting down on ourselves if we just pointed our thoughts toward the direction of our weaknesses. Come on, you about 20 seconds from being down on yourself if you just point your antenna in the wrong direction. But God doesn't want you to point your antenna on your weaknesses of your game. What he wants to say is, holy, let me, let me in, engage with you so that I can strengthen the weaknesses that are in your game. That's fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Let me just, this, none of this is in your notes, but let me just talk about some of the ways that we fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because we need to really understand Holy Spirit is a person. Amen. He's a person. He's not the force be with you. You know, he's not, ooh, some mystical thing. He's a person. He's the third person of the Godhead. In fact, I have a friend uh, <laughs> in ministry. He, it, 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 he's, he, he takes it so personally with Holy Spirit that he doesn't even, it's a little pet peeve of him for, for even to hear the phrase, the Holy Spirit. He just calls him Holy Spirit, right? Because you don't say the Tom. <laughs> you don't say, hey, the Tracy, how you doing? No, you just say, hey, Tracy, hey, Tom, how's it going? Right? Right? Now, don't get all bent out of shape. Don't fall in a ditch or anything. You don't have to change it. I'm just saying I'm making the example of how, how, how we can take it personally. We can take the role of Holy Spirit and his life personally with us. One of the things you do is first thing, you have to quiet your mind to spend time with him. This is the most busy thing in the world. University of Minnesota said years ago that, the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that we have at least 4,000 thoughts per minute. I've heard studies that says many times that. 4,000 thoughts, and of course, 90, 95% of them are unconscious. Now, that's, folks, that's a lot of thinking. And if any of you sat down and spent some time in prayer, rather praying in the understanding, but especially when you pray in other tongues, that's when you see how busy your mind is. 
Because as you go back into teachings, I encourage you to go back, get the CDs, go online, get all of that. Because what scientists have found out, they have confirmed what we've known in Scripture for years, that when you are praying in the Spirit, that the frontal lobe, which, which uh, engages information and communication, the frontal lobe of the brain is actually inactive, which means you are not naturally communicating with your brain. It is spirit to spirit, spirit to spirit, spirit to spirit. But guess what? While your spirit to spirit is going, guess what? Your mind is like, um, okay. <laughs> They're looking at you like, okay, what is he doing? Well, he's praying in tongues. Yeah, well, what do we do? I don't know. Well, I guess he's not using us right now, so I don't know what y'all want to do. I don't know. Let's just think about something. Uh, pizza, dinosaurs, also. <laughs> uh, you know, ladies be like, God, I wonder if that guy dated in high school. I wonder if he's still alive, you know, and, uh, you know, and man, is this, you know, when is my high school reunion? Oh, man, I got to lose weight. Just crazy stuff. I told you one time I was in prayer and I was praying in the tongues and I was just quiet for a minute and all of a sudden I just started singing a Run DMC song. <laughs> I was like, it's like that. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, what am I saying? I'm praying in tongues, I'm singing, it's like that. And come on, that's the way it is. Right? See, what I'm saying is this. See, my brain is used to being busy. And because I wasn't giving it anything to do, it just used to acting. So let's just start exploring. Let's go on our Rolodex, come on. And let's just pull out some stuff. <laughs> he not using us. Let's just do something. So I'm saying that to encourage you. Because when that's happening and your brain is thinking about the most non-spiritual things in the world, you have to know that's not the real you. That's just your brain used to being busy. So one of the things that we have to do, now I'll tell you what, it is important that as you're doing this, you learn to capture your mind and learn to make it submit to what you are doing at the time. Right. Now, David said, this is, this is extra, this is Psalm 131, verse 2, and uh, he said this, he says, I have learned, he says, I've learned to quiet my soul. Surely, he says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. See, a weaned child learned not, not getting no more mama's milk now, not this way. Now stop crying. No, we, we shift into a new chapter now. Not, not, not going to not be this way now. Mama's going to take care of you. Daddy's going to take care of you, but, but not this way. They have to learn how to stop fussing. We're shifting now. See, see our, brain, our minds are always fussing. And one of the ways to develop your relationship with Holy Spirit is tell your mind to make it quiet down. You have to make it submit. Now, one of the things I do, and this is, this is, this is not unique to me, and you read and study on this subject, many will tell you this, take your mind and put it on the things that you're praying about and begin to imagine what you're praying. Imagine his promises. See it fulfilled. See what you're praying about. See that thing coming to pass. Put your thoughts there. Use your imagination there. Right? And while you're doing that, Holy Spirit, who is praying with you and partnering with you in supernatural prayer language, he will help strengthen your faith in that area. And his role, part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to create pictures. Part of what he does is he takes the word of God and turns it into pictures. Because no man doubts what he sees. Catch that. No man doubts what he sees. If you looking at it, you, you can't doubt it. He wants to turn the word into just written information to a picture that you can see. Because then you won't doubt it. And the stronger that picture is, the stronger your faith is in God's word in that area. But he can't turn it into pictures unless we're spending time with him in that area. 
So one of the ways to fellowship with Holy Spirit is to quiet your soul and then take the scriptures and begin to meditate on them or imagine them. The word meditate means to ponder, say them, speak them softly to yourself, talk to yourself about that word, saying it over and over, thinking about it as you're saying it and imagining what you're saying. Wow, he supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Then begin to ask questions. His riches and glory. What would his riches and glory be like? Wow. What are your riches and glory, God? Maybe you don't always have an answer right away, but begin to ask questions. Because you're only entitled to, to answers if you ask questions. And the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And if you will ask the questions, he's ready to begin to speak to you. He may not answer you or you may not proceed to answer right that moment. Don't worry about that. He lives with you. Like, when is he not with you? So he can tell you at any time. And he can talk to you about that by and by. And, and as you begin to do this, you will find him speaking to you in the most uh, mundane situations and circumstances, the most average, common, everyday things that you could be doing. That's when you will hear him speak to you. Amen. Yeah, that, that's how he, that's how he uh, works in our lives. And I, and I, I was mentioning this, uh, but also dial, begin to dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Talk to him. He's a person. Talk to him just like you would a friend. You say, but this sounds silly. This feels silly. No. Remember, you are a spirit. Right. Holy Spirit is a spirit. Right. What you can see, taste, touch, and feel is only one half of reality, guys. Amen. There's a whole other half. It's called the spirit realm. And it's just as real as you see me standing here. Just as real. If God right now opened all of our eyes and we saw into the realm of the Spirit, you would be amazed. Okay? You would see angels in here. You see large, massive angels. You would see the presence of God. I mean, be, it would be amazing what we would see if we saw into that realm. So that realm is very real. And what happens is, as you begin to engage with that realm, then that becomes more real to you. See, what, what happens is, there's a principle in Scripture that says, if you will honor the little that he gives you, he will give you more. In other words, you take the little awareness that you have. Maybe it's just, I just know it in my heart. I don't even have a real sense. I don't have goosebumps. I don't have none of that stuff. But I will take that and act on what I have. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you dwell within me and you live on the inside of me and you are in me right now. Thank you for your abiding presence, Lord. I thank you that you're in me as my partner in life. What God's word says about you is true. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in me. And when you're doing that, what's happening? You are being a steward over what God gave you. And the more you honor that, the more what? They release to reveal more to you. That's how that happens. That's how that happens. And so we have to practice that. And as we practice that, he becomes more real to us. What it's all about, folks, is how real is God to us. At the end of the day, that's what matters. How real is he to us? Because no, no matter what's going on, if he's real to us, we'll be solid. We'll be strong. No matter what the report is, no matter what they say, the reality of who he is. If, I, if, if I'm aware of that, I'm good. Amen. I'm good. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know he's real and I'm aware of it. I'm good. No matter what. That's what we want. That's what we want to go after. And let me just say this here. I don't know how we'll come back to the flow of what I have here. But listen to this. One of the, listen to this. One of the greatest most direct, I mentioned this several messages ago, the most powerful, direct, one of the greatest ways to fellowship with the Holy Spirit is by praying in your heavenly prayer language. It is one of the greatest, quickest, most direct, instantaneous ways. Now listen, what happens is when we're praying in our heavenly prayer language, go back and listen to those messages. We broke it down and, and, and opened it up even further. But when you are doing that, what's happening is you are fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. You are partnering with him in prayer. It is building up your spirit, man, right? It, 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 he's rubbing off on you when you're praying in your heavenly prayer language, okay? It's one of the ways that we can connect with him, right? Because what he is rubs off on who we are. 
Okay? And it's one of the most direct ways to pray that oftentimes people say, I can't, I don't hear God's voice. Come on, how many of us have been there? Or maybe you are at the, right there in some point in our lives. Or, or I, I struggle knowing God's direction. See, when you're praying in the spirit, you're praying spirit to spirit. Remember, your intellect at the moment is not necessarily engaged or fruitful. It doesn't necessarily seem to benefit at the moment. But the real you is a spirit. And Holy Spirit is a spirit. And it's the most direct shot to your spirit that builds you up and helps you develop in your relationship with him because you're praying his language. Spirit to spirit. Spirit to spirit. And that's why Paul says, whoever prays in a tongue edifies himself, builds himself up, rises up, builds up like a building going up. Right? And that's why the enemy, I believe, well, I'm not going to stay on this, but I believe that's why the enemy has tried to introduce such controversy, such, uh, such uh, craziness in the body of Christ over this area because he knows how powerful it is. And think about this for a minute. Paul said this, and this is 1 Corinthians 14, 18, that's extra two. He said this about the whole church. We don't know a whole, we don't have a lot of details about Paul's private devotional life, but we do have some hints. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, he says, I thank my God I'm speaking in tongues more than you all. And in one translation, he said more than the, the, the entire Corinthian church. Now think about that for a minute. And again, this isn't the whole point of the length of the message, but here's this for a second. Here's a guy who is so busy and probably the greatest apostle, uh, at least in church history, in terms of his impact on the world. Can you imagine how busy this is? This man is traveling all around the Mediterranean and the Middle East before the days of airplanes and, and trains and buses and automobiles, when he's going a lot by foot or horse or, or, or boat. All of these things he's doing. When does he time? He's starting churches, helping churches, teaching people, training, raising up leaders. And yet he's saying, I pray in tongues more than all of you. I wonder, is there any connection between how much he spent time fellowshipping and communing with God that way and how much God trusted him with understanding? I wonder if that had to do with how powerful he was in the spirit. I believe there's a direct connection to that. And I, I've often asked this, God, don't you know as intelligent as the Lord is, why would he pick something as something as tongues, one, to birth the church in Acts chapter 2, to be, the, to be the, the, the thing that birthed the church and this tongues thing was a part of that? Why would he pick something that would be so controversial and cause so much debate and so much foolishness in the church in the modern day? Why would he do that? Don't you know he's smart enough to have done something else? Well, here's a principle in God's word. He says he will use the things that men think are foolish to confound the wise. You see, the world finds its strength and the world finds its wisdom in position, possessions, power, beauty, and outward things. If you follow the wisdom of God, his wisdom is found, listen to this, in seeming weakness, in humility. And in things that seem foolish, that's how he sneaks his wisdom in. But because the world doesn't know his style, then it seems offensive when we look at things that seem foolish in terms of his ways. And that's one of the ways. Plus, not only that, it requires humility. Because <laughs> we have to set our intellect aside. And trust that something is greater than us. And so it's just, it's just one of the most direct ways that we connect with him. All right, let's walk through some things that he wants to do with us by teaching us. And you can see Micah chapter 3, verse 8. I love that verse there. It talks about, again, what happens when he rubs off on us. And notice what it says. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions. In other words, Micah said, I am full of power and might by the Spirit of the Lord. Next thing we want to see is this, that he wants to teach you, is your next right in. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you all about who Jesus and the Father are. You see, just because we're born again, that doesn't mean we have a real personal knowledge of Jesus. The Bible says that God is our Heavenly Father. And the Holy Spirit wants to teach us who our Father is. Why? Because we're in His family now. Come on, don't you think we should? Don't you? Don't you think you should know your daddy if you're in His family? 
Come on, I'm not talking natural now. Don't, don't get caught up in what didn't happen in your natural life. I'm saying in your, in your spiritual life, if God is your daddy, don't you think you ought to know him? I mean, wouldn't that be kind of a good idea to know your Savior like the one who bled and died for you? Right? Watch this. Watch this. We Christians claim we're going to spend an eternity with them. Um, if you plan on spending an eternity with somebody, don't you think we ought to get to know them pretty closely before we get over in there? It is important. In fact, Jesus said a quite a sobering statement. We read it last week. He talked about folk that was doing all kind of stuff in his name, and he said they would stand before him. He would say, I never knew you. Yikes. I mean, no, that's a bad time to find out he didn't know you. Come on, let's just take care of that right now, Lord. Let's make sure you know me. You're going to know you know me. And I'm going to know that I know that you know me. There's going to be no doubt that when we cross over, we know one another. Okay, you're not going to be looking at me like, who is that? No, I can't, can't come here. No, 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 sir. No, no. No, we take care of this right now. But seriously, seriously, he's our father. See, see, do we know him? He wants us to know him. And it requires Holy Spirit to teach us who they are. John 15, 26. I've given you more scriptures than we'll necessarily walk through at the time. But listen to this. John 15, 26 says this. But I will send the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the father and will testify, tell you all about me. Part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to tell you all about who Jesus is, right. what he's like, what he's like. The, not, not just what you read, because see, beyond what you read, there's a message behind what you read. If, if, if you could get all the knowledge, watch this, from just reading the Bible, hear, hear how I'm saying it carefully, hear how I'm saying it carefully. If you could get all you need from just reading the Bible, all you need is good reading skills. Right. <laughs> Come on, you wouldn't need Holy Spirit. You just need good reading skills. But then what would happen to the folks who can't read well? What happens if reading is a challenge for some? Because of the weakness of the flesh through sin and brokenness. And people become victims of different things through all kinds of different reasons. What happens to them? That's why Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. And that's why praying in your heavenly prayer language is the great equalizer. Because if it was just about intellectualism and academic prowess and ability, then the most academically skilled and gifted communicators and teachers and learners among us would be the people who know God the most. But you know for sure that isn't the truth because there was a religious order of the culture of Jesus called the Pharisees. And you have to understand, Paul was one of them before he became a disciple of Jesus. And listen, speaking of tongues, this man was an intellectual giant. He went to, to be a Pharisee, to become to where Paul was, you had to go to school the equivalent of, t of, of two decades of religious and Pharisaical training and orders. This man was an intellectual heavyweight. But he said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Right? So if it was about intellect, then listen, man, only the smartest. But yet the smartest people who knew the scriptures by intellect more than anybody else, when the author of the scripture was standing right in front of their face, they couldn't even recognize him. How scary is that? That you can know the Bible and not know God. It's not, a, it's not a push against knowing the Bible. It's talking about how important it is to personally know him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Right? So that's so important. I, I, I wanna, I, I, if, if, if I had my way and I could do it, I'd make you really catch that. that it's, because, see, you need to know Holy Spirit is your equalizer. Because, see, sometimes we look at ourselves, we look at what we didn't have, the tracks that we didn't come from, the wrong side of the tracks, and who I didn't know, what I don't know, what happened to me, bad decisions that I've made, and we think we're disqualified now. The Holy Spirit is the qualifier. He will make you a champion and overcomer. He'll make you smarter, make you look way smarter than you are, make me look way smarter than I am. He's the great equalizer. He's the great equalizer. 
What if I didn't have advantages? What if I didn't come from a good family? What if I didn't have the background that would have that would have put me in this position by this age? That's okay. Fellowship with the one who knows everything. He'll bring you to where he wants you to be. Is anybody getting anything out of this? Let me let me let me move on here. He wants to teach you about Jesus and the Father. Let me go down quickly to John 13, 16, verse 13 through 16. I'll read quickly. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he what? Come on, whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now listen to this very carefully. He will glorify me. Now, generally speaking, it's all right to talk out loud. Let's pretend we're in class here. We are in class in a sense. If I say he glorified this person, what would that basically mean? Come on, t t talk at it. Shout out at me. It, he will glorify. He will what? Praise. Enhance. Yeah, praise, enhance. What else? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hype up. Thank you. Yeah, come on. It's, yeah, he'll hype up. He will glorify, he will praise, he will enhance, he will magnify. He will make me look bigger. That's who Holy Spirit is. Let me tell you something. When you're born again, Jesus, listen, we need Holy Spirit to help Jesus look big as who he really is. See, we don't see him for who he really is. And it requires Holy Spirit to make him look bigger because we're more impressed with other things and other people than we are of him. And the only reason we are, because we haven't let the teacher make him look bigger. He hasn't been glorified in our eyesight. So we're more amazed by people in their lives than the life of Jesus. That's why other things can capture our attention more than him. Because he hasn't been glorified in us. But it's Holy Spirit who says, if you listen to me, if you listen to Holy Spirit, he will glorify him. You will be really impressed with Jesus if you let Holy Spirit teach you and show you how great he is. See, he's the one that one day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I'm talking about the mightiest, most powerful men on the planet. I'm talking about the richest, the most amazing, powerful, talented, gifted men, beautiful men and women, most handsome, beautiful, whatever you call it. They will bow and say, Jesus is Lord. Now, he's the one living in you. And the Holy Spirit wants to magnify him so that we can run well and live strong and represent him well. Let's move on. He wants to do this too. He wants to teach you about what belongs to you as a son of God and about your true identity. He wants to teach you about what belongs to you. 1 Corinthians 2.12, the NIV says this, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but what we have received is the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has what? Freely given us. Right? Holy Spirit wants to teach us what the Father has freely given us. Basically what I'm saying is, he, he, he wants to take us to school. He wants to show us, here's what the Father has freely given you. Here's what belongs to you. He, the Holy Spirit wants to say, you didn't even know this, but look, look at this. Look at what belongs to you. And what this means is, if we automatically knew all of this stuff, why would we need a teacher? Right? See, and, see, and, see, Holy Spirit, his role is to help us live the potential that God put on the inside of us. That's what he wants to do. He wants to, us to live out the potential that he placed on the inside of us. In order to do that, we got to know who our father is. We got to really know who Jesus is. I mean, personally, I don't just mean book knowledge. I mean, heart knowledge. That, that, that's a world of a difference. We need to know what belongs to us. He wants to show us. He wants to show us our true identity. Right. Next thing, the next writing is this. He wants to bring you out of the wilderness and make you an example for what he will do for others. That's what Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to bring you out of the wilderness and make you an example of what he can do for others. Let's look at Psalm number 40 and verses two and three. He wants to bring you out of the wilderness and make you an example 
of what he will do for others. Psalm 40 verses 2 and 3 says this, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. Many, many, many people will see and hear and fear rather the Lord and then they will put their trust in him. Why will many see and fear and have respect for the Lord and then put their trust in him? Because they've seen what he's done in me. They've seen, they've seen him bring me out of the mud. And bring me out of the mire, slippery places, places where I have no stability and strength, and put me on a solid rock. Place my feet on a firm foundation. Then put a new song in my mouth and, and praises to our God. That's what he wants to do. He wants to put a new song in your mouth. He wants to put your feet on a solid ground, put you on a place where you can stand strong. He wants to make an example out of you of what God can do when you put your trust in him and when you, when you learn to commune and fellowship with Holy Spirit. He will tell you and teach you and tutor you and guide you and, and tell you what moves to make and tell you when to be still and tell you when to shut up and tell you what to say. He, he wants to lead you that way. But that comes out of communion and fellowship comes out of being close to him. And that's one of the reasons why your heavenly prayer language, because what it does is it, is it engage, you get to pray at a level beyond your intellect. And he strengthens you and he builds you and, uh, and, uh, and makes you what you could not be on your own. So here's the thing that we need to appreciate because we talk about the Holy Spirit. We need to know this too. And this is on your next page. It says, if you don't know what the word of God has said, you will lack confidence in determining what the Holy Spirit is saying. So Holy Spirit works in conjunction with God's word. Right? He works in conjunction with his word. In other words, there are things that you need in your life. There's direction you need. There's, there's doors that, to be open that you need. There's, there's, there's arrangements that you need in your life that are not explicitly spelled out in the scripture. But Holy Spirit will still guide you in that way. But you see, he always works in line with the scriptures. So why, why is this important? It is important that we have a foundation of regularly reading and hearing God's word in our personal lives. Why? Because the Holy Spirit and the word of God are one. That's found in the scripture too. That's 1 John 5, 7. You just write it down. For the word, the Father, the word, and the spirit, these three are one. So in other words, Holy Spirit will agree with the word. And therefore, when the more we spend time in the word and building the word in us in different categories, especially of life, what does God have to say about this category of life? Everything he says about money, everything he says about relationship, everything he says about seeking God, build those things. Take a, maybe take a month where you're just taking one topic. In addition to your prayer time, you just take one topic and just study everything he's saying in that area. Now you have word on the inside of you that Holy Spirit then can use to guide you and speak to you out of what you put on the inside, right? So when you put it on the inside, you give Holy Spirit something to teach you from. And when you are spending time with the word and studying it, you're also fellowshipping with Holy Spirit because he's the one who breathed it into being, right? So that helps you develop your ear to hear him. So what I'm saying is this, if you never pick up your Bible, never spend any time, if the only time you are looking at scripture is in here, in service, you're going to have a difficult time being, getting, being directed by the Holy Spirit. Because he and his word are one. And then how will you discern his voice from any other voice? That's a common question. People say, how do I know Holy Spirit is speaking? Spend enough time praying in tongues, you'll know. You'll know. You'll know. How will I know? You'll just know. You will know. It, see, it's hard to say it unless you've experienced it. You'll just know. you know. Um, uh, a thousand people can be in this room, and it can be noisy. But if my wife or our son says my name, I'll know it. 
I know it with a thousand people talking at the top of their lungs. I'll know it. How will I know it? Because I know her. Spend time with her. 20 years. Plus our dating time. I know her voice. I know her son's voice. They know mine. I don't even have to see them. I can hear them. It registers. All my knowing capability says, that's my wife. It's the same with Holy Spirit. Why would it be different? Why would it be different? If you can know your friend's voice, why couldn't you know Holy Spirit's voice? He's your friend. Why are we making it so deep? You know why we're making it so deep? Because it just proved that we haven't developed that. Because when you develop it, you don't, you don't question your wife, do you? Do you? You don't hear her voice, you know that's her. Just as, just as plain as day. It's the most obvious, normal thing in the world. It should be that way to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know why it isn't? Because we're too busy in our brains. Too many distractions. Holy Spirit is speaking all the time. You know what the issue is? We're on AM, he's on FM. We're not on the right frequency. If, 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 the, if God is speaking on 91.1 today, FM, literally God himself, if you're on the AM dial, I don't care how much you turn it up, you can turn it up, you can get some, you know, so you can get some big speakers, you can get some, you know, amplification, you can put some loud speakers, you can put, you can blast it, you can do everything up, you can shout, you can cry, you'll never hear him speaking. Why not? Not in the right amplitude, you're not in the right, you're not in the right, you're not in the right frequency. See, we got to get on God's frequency. That's one of the other things praying in the spirit does, puts you on his frequency. Because your intellect don't know how to get on his frequency. Your spirit, why, why do you keep talking about that? Because your spirit is bigger and knows more than your brain does. That's why you need to build your spirit up. And then it will teach your brain. Your spirit is unlimited. That's why, again, the enemy fights this in your life. Tricks you out of it, says you don't have it, says you're doing, you sound stupid, down, sounds foolish, or you can't. All of that stuff. Let me tell you why. Because he knows how powerful it is. And if I was the devil, I'd try to stop you too. Or he'll make you think of folks that acted crazy and goofy and foolish with it. Right? All right? We never, you never, if, if you could spy on a people who are counterfeiting money right now, and somehow we have the ability to see and watch the room where they were trying to counterfeit United States currency, I guarantee you they wouldn't be counterfeiting $1 bills. <laughs> guarantee you. I don't even, I don't even have to know. I, I guarantee you they won't be counterfeiting ones. Will they? I said, will they? No. What will they be counterfeiting? 99 times out of 100, $100 bills. And did you notice, this was a USA Today study in 2015, I've heard this in other studies, that actually the 100 is more in circulation than dollars. It's between the $100 bill and the $1 bill. There are more hundreds in circulation than 20s or 5s or 10s. Did you know that? That'll help your prosperity thinking. Just the fact that there's actually more of them in circulation than 20s. God, I just need 20. Well, there's more hundreds out there. Go ahead and believe me for 100. You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to stretch your thinking. There's literally, just, I mean, without the Holy Ghost, there's just more hundreds in circulation. So just believe for one of them. It's already more of them out there. But see how we would tend to think it's not as many hundreds if you haven't seen a many. There's actually more of them out there. I don't know why I got on that. Lord, have mercy. What was I talking about? The Holy Spirit, that wasn't it. What was it? Counterfeit. That's why the enemy counterfeits tongues or tries to corrupt it because that's valuable. You only try to counterfeit or corrupt what's real. You don't mess with the fake because it has no value. All right. That's how you can recognize where the enemy is trying to work. You can recognize oftentimes what's real by what he attacks the most. That's why you can talk about any other religion and do anything else in our culture. When you start in the name of Jesus, all hell breaks loose. Why not with other things? Wonder if there's no reason to attack that. Just a thought. All right, let's end this. Let's wrap up. 
1 John 5, 7 talks about the word and the spirit. Listen to this. Write this down. What water is to your physical body is what the word is to your spirit. What does water do? It refreshes. Come on. Water cleanses you, doesn't it? Right? Water qu huh? quenches your thirst, feeds your cells, does all kind of stuff, right? Helps your blood, helps clean the inside of you, all that stuff. What water does to your body, the word does to your spirit. Watch this. What lack of water does to the body, lack of word does to your spirit. Your blood is thicker and more sluggish. You're more fatigued when you don't have enough water in you. You're dehydrated whether you know it or not when you don't have enough water. Your organs, your internal organs don't work at the optimum level when you don't have enough water. All the stuff that's in you in Christ Jesus doesn't work when it is not lubricated by the water of the word of God. All right. Lastly, he'll do this. Last two. One more. He'll teach us to profit. He wants to teach us how to profit. Isaiah 48, 17 says, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches you to profit and lead you by the way you should go. He will teach you. That's not P-R-O-P-H-E-T like prophet prophesy. No. He will teach you to P-R-O-F-I-T, profit. All right? All right? And then read the other verses there. He'll lead you in the way you should go. Last thing I want to point out, and we'll, we'll end on this. Rewards will come. To those who put in work. <laughs> yeah. Come on, you know that's a very popular phrase nowadays, isn't it? Putting in work, man. Putting in work. How I many you know that's a popular phrase? You, you, don't, you can't go on social media for five minutes without seeing somebody talking about how they're putting in work. And now it's to the point where, where it's like a cool thing to take a picture of yourself working out. <laughs> then you look at the camera. Hold on. <laughs> Putting in work, dog. Right? Right? What, 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 what's this thing now we showing ourselves working out? <laughs> you know why? I don't, I don't know what the deal is behind it, but, but we're saying, look, I'm doing the stuff that's going to help put me in shape. We spend a lot of time talking about putting in work on the outside. And we ought to put in work on the outside. Bodily exercise is important. Come on, somebody. But we ought not to neglect putting, on work on the, putting in work on the inside. See, when you and I will put in the work, we will have the fruit in our lives. I want to encourage you to take time, wherever you are in your life, take time to engage more with the Holy Spirit. Quiet your mind before him. Take time to conversate with him. Take 15, 20, 20 minutes out of the day. Take time where if you pray, I pray a half hour. Take your time up to an hour praying in tongues. Find ways to increase that time in fellowshipping with him. And you'll begin to see him teach you through the school of the Holy Spirit, taking our lives up and to the right in every area. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of the word of God today? All right, let's just end right there. Father, thank you so much for this.